are surrounded by water. And, you know, we used to think that the water is just there because we are 90 percent water. But actually, the water around the biomolecules in plants and, and, and animals and humans actually serves a, a regulatory role in the sense that it defines the properties of the biomolecules. So that means that the water itself uh, determines the structure of the molecules. And structure, of course, is related to function. And the, the relationship between the hydration shell, which is the technical term for the water that surrounds all the molecules, uh, actually determines the structure, or at least the, what's called the tertiary structure. Uh, all molecules have a primary, secondary, and tertiary structure, getting technical here, but uh, uh, the tertiary structure is the overall conformation or shape of the molecule. And uh, that's just as important as the primary structure. For example, DNA, uh, is the primary structure is composed of nucleotides. Uh, the secondary structure is the helix. And the tertiary structure would be the helix, which wraps itself in all kinds of unusual configurations. And uh, that's just a, an example of how important the uh, uh, water is in the structure of molecules. And, of course, it carries oxygen, it carries nutrients, it carries ions, it carries uh, electricity, because ions have a charge, and it carries information. In the brief introduction, I talked about that, which I won't talk about, because that's a whole topic in itself. Uh, but just conceptually, uh, water carries lots of information about the biomolecules. I mean, look at homeopathy. You separate the molecule from the energy of the molecule. So what's left behind? You dilute the molecule out. What's left behind is the, the energy of the molecule. And that's called homeopathic solution. And obviously, that has all kinds of biological effects. <coughs> so the um, conclusion from this slide is that all these processes are, are, are basic and important. And when the water is not <clears throat> uh, structured, and if there's not enough of the water, then all these functions that I was just talking about don't perform optimally. And you become dehydrated and get disease. If you're a human, I don't know if plants get dehydrated, but they do get disease. So, oh, right, bio water. So that's a whole term in itself. So water inside the humans and inside plants actually is structured. And we'll hear more about that. But uh, the point is that it's, it's when you don't have enough of it, you become dehydrated. Two thirds of the population, in the, at least in America, probably worldwide, it's even higher, are dehydrated. Because the water we drink is not uh, structured. And we need the structuring because that's what's naturally present in our bodies. And as we age, the structuring decreases. And of course, as we, when we have disease, we're, uh, where the water is not structured. And in the plant world, uh, the lack of water obviously slows down the growth and, and affects the yield of the crop. That's pretty obvious for this group. But I thought I'd throw it in. OK. Uh, so let's, uh, in plants, uh, here's a little bit about water in plants. So we all know it's involved with diffusion, absorption, evaporation actually transport into the cells across the cell membrane, uh, which I'll talk more about because that's kind of a key component, how the water and the nutrients that it carries actually gets into the cells. And uh, water uh, carries information. Wow, I'm repeating myself, but that, that's an important point, which I'm not going to talk about. No, sorry. OK, so uh, let's start with the um, plant world here, or continue with the plant world. Uh, and talk about the cuticle. I haven't heard anybody mention that term yet in this conference. But that's like the outer membrane of, of the plant, which is the interface between the environment and the inside of the plant. And of course, water in plants, uh, uh, the function of the, sorry, the cuticle, the function of the cuticle is to keep the water in the plants and keep the toxins out. And it has to do with the uh, wettability, it has to do with the uh, absorption or absorption of the water into the cell, transpiration, and the permeability across the cell membrane. 
permeability is another word, fancy word for uptake of the nutrients and the water into the um, cell membrane. And you can see all the stuff, it's layers it's got to go through. Uh, but there are channels, and, and, uh, and they're called aquaporins, which are water channels. But in fact, uh, these channels not only allow water in, but they also allow the minerals in. OK. Hmm. So uh, the, the cuticle has water surrounding it. This is a pretty lousy picture of water molecules, uh, although they, it's a hexagonal shape. Uh, um, they don't quite look like that. Uh, you know, water has uh, <laughs> uh, one oxygen and two hydrogen, so it's got negative and positive charges, which allows it to cluster together because the negative of the oxygen can bind to the hydrogen of the nearby water molecule via an electrostatic bond that's different than a covalent bond. It's just like an electrical uh, communication by virtue of the positive and negative charges. So the water on the outside of the cell, uh, of the cuticle, uh, is, um, is structured, but it's, it's only structured in the, air, the region right uh, around the, the, the top of the membrane. So this is the, it would be the cuticle in, this, in the sense that it's a cell membrane. And the water molecules that right along the surface would be structured, and the water that would be outside in the extracellular fluid is not structured. And this is a, I, I chose this diagram because it kind of represents the fact that there's a lot of water outside and very little bit gets in uh, comparatively. And that's the whole point uh, of, uh, of the talk, in a sense, is you know, how to get more water into the cells and how to get the nutrients and um, minerals in along with it. So in the case of the cuticle, the actual uh, degree of hydration determines the mechanical properties of this membrane itself, and hence its ability to transport information into the cell. Now, um, you know, the cell is uh, negatively charged on the surface. So obviously the positive part of the water molecules are going to bind. And then the negative part will be, again, exposed to the outside. So the more uh, hydrogen from adjacent water molecules can bind to the oxygen. And, and if we're lucky, then it becomes structured. And otherwise, it becomes a little chaotic, like, like that picture. So, in, in the science, you know, people go like, oh, what is structured water? Well, in the scientific community, they don't call it structured water. It's called clustered water. I have a couple of references I can show you later. But most recently, it's also called interfacial water because it acts as the interface between the membrane and the bulk water in the body or in the cells or in the, in the plant. Uh, but uh, Dr. Pollack has uh, written a book called The Fourth Phase of Water, which a lot of people have heard about and has become quite famous. He's rather popularized the whole field of uh, water. And uh, he calls it easy water. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a fourth phase in the sense that you know, we, we consider water to be either solid or liquid or gas. But liquid water or bulk water actually has solid ice-like crystals inside of it. And that's referring to the structuring of the clusters that form um, in the bulk water. So that's why uh, Dr. Pollack is so famous, because he describes this as the fourth phase. So it, and another technical term would be a liquid crystal. So it's like crystalline lattices <clears throat> distributed <clears throat> in the bulk water. And these clusters or, or structures can exist either as four, five, six, or eight molecules around, usually around another molecule, like a protein molecule or a, uh, an ion or a mineral, or around the cell membrane itself. So that's the overview. And here's a picture of structured water uh, and unstructured water. So you can see that the stars in the diagram represents the chemicals, the molecules, pollutants, 
um, in this particular example, and electrolytes and minerals, etc. And in this particular diagram, you can see on the left, my left, your left, okay, uh, a hexagonal structure. So if you remember the previous slide, we got four, five, six, or eight. Well, hexagon is six, pentagon is five. So these would be hexagonal water clusters that are forming. Uh, in contrast to, uh, on the right, normal water. This is the water that we drink. This is the water that, that uh, we feed our plants, unless you're feeding it right from a stream. Well water probably was structured when it came out of the ground, but by the time it sits around uh, for months and years, it just sits there. It's probably not structured, although I don't know anybody that's ever measured the structuring. To measure the structure, you need a very sophisticated piece of equipment called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or NMR spectroscopy, and that's a university-grade machine that's ridiculously expensive, so nobody actually measures whether their water is structured. And I don't know of anybody who's measured well water to know if it's structured. The problem with, with structured water is it doesn't last very long. It forms these really cool structures, but uh, uh, it just doesn't stay like that for very long. In nature, if the water is in a stream and it's moving all the time and it's going over rocks and it's, it's uh, perturbed in that way, it maintains the structure. But as soon as it becomes stationary, like you put it in a bottle <laughs> and then you drink it several months after it's been put in that bottle, it's no longer structured. And I would call that dead water as the sink from living water, which is structured living in the sense that that's what's naturally present in our body. Okay, so here's the visual. So now that everybody knows what structured water is, okay, we're good. We can talk a little bit more about what it does uh, to the plant world and the, and the animal world and the um, humans as well. So uh, we've talked about uh, the permeability of how this water gets across the cell membrane and the, um, the, the cuticle. Uh, I found an article that talked about uh, the cuticle in ivy plants and the permeability of water. And the three factors that determine uh, to what extent the water gets into the plant is the water, the, how strong the binding of the water is. So the binding would be the actual, uh, uh, no, I've got to go back a bit. Uh, the, the binding of the water would be this guy. These two be, are bound to the surface. That's the very first step. But then it has to go through the cell membrane. Um, and in order to get through the cell membrane, depending on how large the hydration shell is around the electrolyte or the mineral, uh, it will go in or not. So the problem is that most structuring in, in, in water uh, in, in the body is rather large. The structures are large. Uh, the two, two, four, six, and eight structures are small. They, they, can, they can be as large as 100 molecules of water around each electrolyte or each mineral. And if it's that big, it's not going to go through the cell membrane. So uh, the size of, this, of the hydration shell and the degree to which it's structured makes all the difference. Uh, and here's the, a couple of scientific references uh, that actually talk specifically about the cuticle and the water absorption and, and this second article here about the, hydra the hydration shell size. This is the point. How big is that hydration shell around the molecule? Okay, so we've now going to part one. That was the introduction. <laughs> okay, we're, now we're getting there, um, little by little. I did mention this, just to show you a pretty picture. Uh, that would be structured water in nature. Uh, structured water in farming, well, biodynamic farming, uh, uses um, flow forms. And uh, what they do is to structure the water. So you guys are probably familiar with that, but here's just a picture or two. And it's this, this, this particular uh, motion of the water that, uh, that causes it to um, structure, like in nature. And uh, Schauberger is a German scientist 
who studied this like for his whole life and um, and I don't know if this particular struct, uh, form is uh, related to Schauberger's method of structuring water, but uh, he uh, based all of his work on what happens in nature. So I'm assuming that the water that comes out of this thing at the bottom here uh, would be structured, but again, who measures that? It's too expensive, so we don't really know for sure. But this probably would do it. Okay, clustered water in science. Well, as I said, it, it's, it's um, structured water is called clustered water. Here's three different articles, uh, one from the uh, Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineers, which the IEEE is like, you know, the big legitimate uh, establishment uh, group of scientists who study all kinds of things, technology mostly. Uh, Second article here is in the uh, Journal of Chemical Physics, and the third article is in an organic chemistry journal. So the scientists who study this kind of phenomena are across the board. And, you know, as I talked to somebody here uh, the first day, and they go, oh, I read your abstract, and it was structured water. It sounded so woo-woo to me, and I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm trying to convince everybody that, that there is real science here, and uh, that it's... Um, Something that uh, scientists study, but not a lot. So it, it is kind of frontier science in the sense that it's not, I mean, these are published in mainstream journals, but, you know, it, I, I just got back from the International Water Conference, okay, for example. And there were probably 100 scientists there studying the esoteric properties of water. And, uh, and that was, that's probably about it in the whole world. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of scientists, but they all meet every year in Bulgaria, of all places. Uh, uh, they used to have it in New Hampshire, and then they, they realized that three quarters of the scientists were coming from Europe and Eastern Europe and Russia, because that's where they, ha the scientists are trained in a different way, and they understand the, uh, significance of, of esoteric properties of water. So they just moved the conference to Bulgaria. Um, but uh, nonetheless, the, the, there are scientists who study it. So uh, this is a scientific discipline. It has sort of been taken up by the popular scientific, uh, non-scientific world. And there's a lot of books about, uh, let's see, where, where are those books about? Hexagonal water. Uh, here, for example, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, hexagonal water is one kind of water, and there are a lot of popular books about hexagonal water. Uh, not scientific. I haven't read them necessarily, but typically they're not scientific. Uh, oh, this guy's by a doctor. Okay, well, maybe it is. Anyway, the point is that <laughs> the scientific community does study this kind of stuff. All right. Uh, so here's another diagram of, um, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So. The clustering on the left is a typical size of a cluster around an electrolyte or a mineral. And the clustering on the right is, is, the, is an example of the hexagonal structure around uh, a, a small, simple molecule. Uh, and you can see the difference. The size difference is, is enormous. And that's what, what I mean when I say the, the normal electrolytes and, and uh, ions and uh, minerals that that may be in the mineral and I mean, in the soil don't necessarily get into the plants. It's a very inefficient system if the if the structure is that large, it just doesn't go through the cell membrane. I think I've made that point by now. Okay. Oh, let's make it some more. Here's a picture. <laughs> just honest. Last time we'll talk about this. Uh, so there's a large molecule on the right. Does not go through. Small molecules can go through. Of course, it depends on the size of the pore, and this particular diagram is, is the, the, the width of this and the width of this don't really match reality, but the point being that this kind of a small molecule can go through the cell membrane. Okay, you got it. All right. So what else can we say about hexagonal water? Uh, because it turns out between pentagonal and hexagonal water that hexagonal water is better than, uh, than the pentagonal water in the sense that uh, these are all based on scientific studies that uh, it moves more efficiently through the body, it hydrates more efficiently, 
Uh, it goes through the aquaporins, which is the name of those little channels uh, that allow water and minerals into the cells. It carries nutrients and oxygen. Uh, remember, gases can be dissolved in water as much as chemical structures like uh, ions and minerals. Uh, and oxygen and CO2 are the two obvious things that have to go in and out of the cells. And um, hexagonal water uh, is the kind of water that's found in Lord's Healing Waters. Now, I mentioned that to a couple of people so far, and people go, What's, where's Lord's? Uh, and what is the healing waters all about? Uh, but, uh, okay, before I do that, here's a, another example of hexagonal water in nature, snowflakes. Uh, so there's, um, uh, the, the one on the right is a blow up of the, of the uh, uh, infrastructure on the left. Okay, so, uh, okay, we're going to continue a little bit with hexagonal water. Hexagonal water is studied in the scientific uh, community. Here's an article from um, in the chemical journal from MIT, uh, nonetheless, talking about these l localized crystalline lattice hexagonal ice-like structures that exist in bulk water or liquid water. And here's a study uh, showing, uh, you know, investigating this, this phenomenon. Again, this is all scientific stuff. Okay, now we can continue with Lord's water, which is a natural healing springs. And the whole spiel about Lord's is that it, people have been going there for like thousands of years and drinking the water and having these miraculous healings. So there's got to be something special about this, right? Um, and um, it turns out that what's special about it is uh, been evaluated by my colleague, uh, Lee Lorenzen, who actually did NMR studies of the natural healing waters on, on the planet, Japan, France, uh, South Africa, I mean, they're all over the place. And he actually did the NMR studies on this water compared to regular water and discovered that there's a very characteristic peak, uh, which you can sort of barely, oh boy, that doesn't come out so clear, does it? So here's uh, the uh, NMR data where you see this is 60, 100, 150. So normal water looks like this, where, where there's a, a huge peak at around 120 hertz. And it, there's, if, if any, there's a very small, if no, peak at 65 hertz. Lord's water looks the opposite. It's the exact opposite. This peak is very small, and this peak is very large. So there's something in all of these natural healing waters that's unique about the 65 hertz peak that shows up in this kind of spectroscopy. The problem with it is it doesn't last very long. Structuring doesn't, now this is related to the structuring. NMR, as I said before, is used to measure the structuring of the water. And this is uh, one of the characteristic signatures of structured water. It has this peak at 65 hertz. But it doesn't last very long, as I said. So people who go to Lourdes and they bring the water back to their hotel and they drink it, they don't get healed. If, if you drink it right on the spot, uh, and uh, then you get all these healing benefits. So um, that's the spiel about Lord's healing water. And we already covered hexagonal water. Now, Lord's water, there's not a lot of scientific research on Lord's water. But here's a study that was done in a nice, obscure uh, journal in Italian. I think that's Italian. Is this Italian up here? Uh, it sound, looks like Italian. Uh, and what they show, they measure the pH uh, of, of this water. But you can see here that in order to uh, measure these effects, they had to dilute the um, Lord's water one to 400,000. And if they diluted that little bit, they could still, that huge amount, they could still measure changes in the pH compared to regular water. I mean, that actually shifts the, that little drop of, uh, of, uh, of Lord's water in, in several gallons of regular water lowers the pH. So that is an interesting phenomenon. You could call that an anomalous 
of water. That's not what you'd expect to happen. Uh, and, um, and that was actually published in a journal. So Lord's water uh, is kind of uh, interesting water, but it's not stable. And then I mentioned uh, Dr. Lorenzen before. He actually got a patent on how to stabilize water so that it has the same 65 hertz signature and it lasts for two to three years. And that's the basis of the patent. The process involves treating not even the water, you treat the steam uh, after the water evaporates, it is distilled. You treat the steam with a series of magnetic fields, very, very strong magnetic fields and light. And uh, then it condenses and then, and then you keep re repeating that cycle over and over again for a long time. And eventually the water gets the message and goes, okay, I'm going to become structured. And I'm going to become structured just like Lord's. And that was confirmed. The basis of the patent is, is, is uh, the fact that A, it's structured, which was confirmed by NMR, and B, the fact that that structure lasts for two to three years. And you can read about that on the website. <clears throat> And that's the water that I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this talk in terms of its effects on plant, the plant world and human uh, health. It, we call, he calls it micro-clustered water because it, it, it turns out to be hexagonal. Uh, and, it, and hexagonal water, we now are experts on hexagonal water, hopefully. OK. so. The next point is that, uh, I think I probably covered most of these. Uh, the water is called Vivo water. So the website is for Vivo. Um, it's hexagonal, 65 hertz. And it turns out that this water has similar healing properties to Lourdes. And it has beneficial effects on humans, animals, and plants. These studies have been scientifically validated. Some of them are published, but they were all done scientifically. And um, it's the only bottled water on the market that has been documented and proven to be structured. There's a lot of bottled waters on the market that say structured. But again, it's so expensive, nobody actually measures the structuring, uh, except Lee actually did. And uh, the water has been on the market now for 10 years. And it, it's got, he's got bottling plants in countries all over the world. And it is commercially available. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really remarkable uh, water, which you will hear about. It's uh, the clinical studies that we did uh, to validate these claims that it has beneficial effects on humans, animals, and plants. Okay. So uh, here's a summary. Uh, I mean, if this was a biomedical conference, I'd probably go into all these studies in a little more detail. But... Um, uh, these were done at various universities, uh, mostly, um, and mostly in California, uh, but also in China and Mexico. Uh, the water increases wound healing in mice. Uh, it, act, it's, um, it acts in conjunction with cisplatinum to treat cancer. And I'll talk a little bit more about when you take a chemical or a drug or an herb up in this water, it becomes way more potent and bioavailable um, than if you take it up in ordinary water. So uh, the combination, uh, in this case, of cisplatinum in this structured water was very effective for treating cancer. Um, it increases endurance, recovery, and stamina, uh, both in animals and in uh, athletes. And right now, uh, we're in the process of um, selling this water and, and, and uh, to the uh, NFL uh, football players and baseball players in an attempt to uh, get them healthy. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of them are pretty in touch with their bodies. And they drink this water, and they go, oh my god, this is so much better than the Gatorade. And little by little, they're throwing away the Gatorade and starting to drink this water. And more and more gyms are, are starting to introduce this water uh, for the same reason. So, I mean, that's kind of the, uh, the commercialization aspect of it. But the science is here. And um, it does actually really affect the, their performance. 
a couple of studies, two studies were done with diabetics. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how it actually uh, lowers blood glucose levels. Uh, it improves the immune function. And it hydrates better than normal water. Now, part of the problem here is that, you know, normal water is, as I said, dead. And it's so inefficient at hydrating the body, which means, as I said, it doesn't get into the cells. But um, Dr. Lorenzen actually measured the amount of, after drinking the water, how much is inside the cells and how much is outside the cells, and measured the ratio of intracellular to extracellular water, and showed that there was, you know, the, the shift of, uh, was from the outside to the inside of the cell. There was more inside the cell, and therefore we can conclude that it hydrates better, which is an important point because you know, you're supposed to drink eight glasses of water a day. Well, why? That seems like a lot, and nobody drinks eight glasses of water. And uh, that's because if you drink dead water, it's, it's very, it, or non-structured water, it's not very efficient at hydrating the body. You need a lot of it to hydrate the body. And still two-thirds of the people on the, uh, 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 are dehydrated. So, um, therefore, you know, hydra and there's a lot of studies showing, medical studies that show just the amount, uh, the degree of, of uh, Hydration uh, is um, is uh, critical for the body. I mean, you know, dehydration is a cause of so many diseases. It's it, it, it's amazing. I think they did a study where they just took a whole variety of people with a lot of different diseases and gave them water, and 50% of them got better. <laughs> I mean, literally, just from drinking water. Oh, a question. Yes. Oh, please. <clears throat> yes, okay. Lee, Lee himself, Dr. Lorenzen himself, funded the, funded these studies because he was trying to get you know the information out, uh, and um, but they were done at university, so you know we like to think they're unbiased. Okay, uh, hydrates better. Clinical studies, lactic acid uh, flushing. Okay, so I want to look at uh, oh before we do that. The other side of this is that in South Africa, this water is basically given away uh, to people who are very dehydrated, and these people just love their love this water. And at one point, there were, one of these shops closed down, and the people were freaking out, and they were rebelling, and they were complaining. All oh, the government, you can't close down our hydro shops uh, because you, you know the. They, they, you can feel the difference. You got to you got to drink the water for a couple of weeks to flush out all the dead water in the in the body. But once you once you're on it, it's like you just feel so much better. And it depends on wh where your weakness is. I mean, you know, people who have migraine headaches, they go away because that's their issue. They have migraine headaches. Drink the water, the migraine headaches go away. I don't have migraine headaches, so I don't have that problem. I drink the water and I digest it better. But it kind of depends on what you, where your weakness is in terms of how it affects the body. But these people are benefiting by the body, and it's kind of the humanitarian effort uh, to actually get this water out to the public. And in South Africa, it's called Wonder Water. So there's a picture of Wonder Water. OK. Uh, and just to finish up with the uh, Vivo company, they've gotten a lot of Awards. They got the National Nutritional Food Association Award. Uh, they got a Bill Gates Award, and this the stuff has been presented at the United Nations. And uh, you know, it's it, it's you know, somebody gave me the analogy with biochar. I mean, you know, this biochar really works, and it helps with the yield of crops, but not everyone uses it. So there's still you know resistance uh, to actually get people to say, oh my God, I got to grow my plants with this water or char or whatever. So yeah, you guys are open to this kind of stuff, so that's why I'm here, and hopefully I'll convince you at the end of this about the benefits of the water. So here's a, a study that was done on swimming endurance. Just to give you a, a, an example of, uh, this was published in the International Society for Sports Nutrition, and it was a study done with mice, and you plop the mice in, the, in water, and you see how uh, law, law, how strong they are, how long they can swim. And of course, if they drink the uh, distilled water or Vivo or even diluted Vivo water, they're, 
their, the amount of time that they can swim goes from 16 seconds to 38 seconds. So that says a lot about their physiology and their strength, just you know, like just how they, how they drink the water. And what's interesting here is that diluted vivo works even better than, than the undiluted vivo, which is a bit like homeopathy, but not really. And it's, the point is that uh, uh, it, it helps strengthen the endur endurance of the mice. Okay, that's one study. Uh, another study, um, I do get to the plants eventually, so hang in there, you know, <laughs> um, getting there close. Another study that was done uh, with um, diabetics, and, uh, and, and it was done at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and, and other places. They took 330 diabetics in a random dub double-blind clinical study, measured blood glucose, uh, measured, this is the study where they measured the extracellular and intracellular water, they measured base metabolism, and they measured a thing called phase angle, which is a bioimpedance measurement, which is a measure of overall health, uh, 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 it correlates with disease, uh, the, the, uh, the stronger, the, uh, the larger the phase angle is, the less disease in general. Uh, it correlates with aging, it correlates with cell function, it correlates with hydration. Here's an example of a study in the journal Clinical Nutrition, which talked about, well, bioelectric impedance measurements is the fancy name for phase angle, uh, and clinical practice. So um, it's a standard, perhaps unknown, but it's a, it's a, it is a, an acknowledged standard way of measuring overall health. And in this particular study, uh, with the diabetics, you can see that over time, uh, the uh, vivo water goes, if you drink vivo water, your, your face angle goes up. If you drink regular water, your face angle goes down. So, uh, and, it, and, and in addition, the blood glucose levels drop by 30%, and overall health is, is improved. So this is a, another example of a study. Uh, now. Yeah, the phase angle also correlates with sports performance, and, the, and here's a scientific reference to that fact, published in the Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance. Uh, and they did another study with um, um, mixed martial artists who are pretty healthy to start with. I mean, these guys are fit, and you know they do this kind of stuff all the time. And uh, this is a measure of the phase angle in 22 different athletes. And the point of showing you the in, instead of the averages, and overall the average is statistically significant, but the point is that in some people there are huge increases uh, in the phase angle, whereas other people have a relatively small effect, although everybody showed an increase relative to the control. And this is part of the problem when you do clinical studies, everyone's different. <laughs> So you have to uh, take that into account. You've got to do a large number of people, take the overall average, and in this case, we've got highly signif statistically significant increase in phase angle, <coughs> which then correlates with all those, the sports performance, as I said. Okay, so that's another study, and now we're moving on to animal studies, and hang in there, because we're getting close to plants. So I just want to, you know, animals, if you put regular water and, and vivo water in front of a, a cat or a dog or any animal for that matter, they will always drink the vivo water just because they know better, it smells better. I mean, it's just water. <laughs> There's no chemicals in it. Uh, it's the starting material is distilled water, by the way, and then you add minerals to it and the water structures around the minerals. But animals seem to know what's going on. So the, um, this particular uh, is not a study, but it's an observation. We're, we're looking for um, um, veterinarian scientists who could actually do a proper study. But this particular uh, example was uh, two racehorses which were, I guess you could over the hill. They were not feeling well. They were kind of not racing because they weren't, you know, I don't know, they had a cold and they were like sick and they were sick for like a long time and then they drank vivo water and after three days oops typo after three days of drinking the vivo water 
they were walking around, they looked great, and they were, you know, energetic, so they, uh, they decided to put them back in the race, and these two horses, believe it or not, won first and second place. So what are the odds of that? Uh, and there's a picture of them in action. So that's just an example, uh, I mean, it's so many examples of, of animals that just get better. They drink the water, and, you know, a couple of days later, they're, they're, all, they're all better. Uh, this is a dramatic example, so I thought I would show that as an example. Okay, hang in there, we're doing good. Uh, now we're ready to talk about plants. Okay, so <clears throat> it turns out that plants, as, as the title of my talk, uh, there's increased uh, growth in metabolism. We've done it in um, palm trees, hemp, chia seeds, radishes, and tomatoes. Tomatoes didn't really count because it wasn't really a scientific study. Here's two toma tomato plants, and you feed the one, and, you know, grows bigger. Palm trees, again, not a scientific study, uh, but uh, here's a, some pictures of, um, of, okay, so on the right, we have, on the bottom, you can see, uh, that's Dr. Lorenzen, by the way, in his home. Down here is his uh, pool, and uh, he put structured water, uh, enough of it in, in, to make this structured. And the trees that grow around I I the, the, the pool are huge. So here's an example of a palm tree that just happens to be right near the pool. And here's an example of a palm tree uh, in the adjacent uh, yard where there are no structured water around. I know it's not scientific, but it gives you some idea of uh, the uh, potential effects. So then we decided to do a scientific study, and we did a study with hemp grown outdoors in soil. And we started with 25 seedlings, and they were fed uh, one liter per day uh, for the first couple of weeks, and then they increased it to two liters, and then three liters. So by the, by the end of the study, uh, they were getting a lot, of, a lot of structured water, and in the end, they actually, you know, pulled them out of the ground, uh, measured the biomass, uh, which increased by 80 percent, and then also did the chemical analysis and showed that the CBD concentration increased by 30 percent. So that was a very encouraging start, and then, of course, the question is, well, does it only work for hemp plants? Is there something unique about hemp plants? Uh, and therefore, we extended those studies to other kind of plants. Um, here's a picture of the hemp grown. Uh, it was done by, um, a far by some farmer in Colorado who was interested enough in the, uh, to take some plants and just feed them uh, the hemp. And you could see that uh, after 12 weeks, uh, the controls were 30 inches high, and uh, after uh, the same amount of time, the tree, once treated with vivo water, were 54 inches high. So that comes out to 80%. So that's uh, a visual of the, uh, what it looks like. Okay, so that's hemp. Can we move on to chia seeds? Okay, let's move on to chia seeds. Okay, so this was um, done by an independent, in answer to your question, by an independent uh, company called Vita Technologies. And they um, started with seeds. Uh, they soaked them in either regular water or vivo water for three days. Uh, in this case, it was distilled water that was supplemented with uh, minerals at three parts per million because the vivo water has only three parts per million minerals. It's a pretty low concentration, but remember, they're all, the water is clustered around them, so <coughs> it may be a low concentration, but it's highly effective. And this particular company decided to look at not only the vivo water, but different dilutions of the vivo water. Uh, one to 250, one to 500, and one to 750. So they um, uh, grew these things in uh, the sprouts uh, for two weeks in the absence of soil in these kind of, uh, you know, uh, chambers here that um, just, you know, raw growth in the absence of soil, which is interesting. And then they measured the weight, of course, and then the biochemical analysis of the nutrients. Okay, so here's the mass, uh, uh, the overall weight of the plants at the end of the study. 
Um, and you can see that the uh, mass goes up by words. That's about 30 per percent. I don't have a number there for you. But it's interesting that the most diluted one works the best. And in fact, depending on which biochemical metabolite you measured, uh, you would get the maximum effect at either one of these three concentrations. So, which um, is an interesting observation. We need to do more of that because we're going to give this to farmers. Do you dilute it? How much do you dilute it? And uh, all unknown at this point. But at least for chia seeds, we know the, the behavior. Okay, so here's uh, the metabolite. So if you actually measure the fat, the omega-3 and omega-6 content, uh, they all go up by about 100%. The blue uh, bars on the left are um, the control water, and the red bars on the right are the vivo water at, by the end of the study. Okay, uh, that's a pretty reasonable, that's a twofold effect, that's pretty reasonable. Uh, in the case of omega-9 uh, fatty acids, uh, it went up by 300, almost 350%. Uh, and again, um, that was uh, surprising because the omega threes and six were significantly less, and the nitrogen went up by 104 percent. So most things go up about 100 percent. But and in the chia seed, we measured calcium, and the calcium went up by only 38 percent. So it's very specific to the actual metabolite that we're measuring in terms of the effect. Okay, so that was the study with chia seeds. Next study is with radishes. It was also done by the same group. Um, pretty much the same protocol. They soaked the seeds, sprouted the seeds, uh, uh, the same distilled water versus vivo water. But in this case, they were grown in soil. So the seedlings were transferred to soil and then uh, uh, fed, I think, like 500 milliliters uh, of water a day and did the same kind of um, analysis. And here's a picture of the, of the plants. Um, uh, this, in this case, it was 250, one to, diluted one to 250. You could see the, the I mean, it's not the best uh, but, uh, picture here, but you could see the difference in the size and the, and the uh, well, it looks a lot better there. Hmm. All right. Anyway. Um, so they did the same as a visual to look at the, how they did it. And in this case, they did, they did the same measurements. And they were, the point is that they were very different than the chia seeds as to which metabolites affected, were affected. And I just chose three as an example. In this case, just to compare the radishes and the chia seeds. So we said before that the chia seeds all, all went up by about 100%, 38%. Well, radishes don't, the protein didn't go up hardly at all. Uh, the nitrogen went a little bit, but look at this. The, the calcium concentration went up by 1,200%. So that was a, that's like more than tenfold increase, which is huge. And um, the percents are calculated relative to the control. So this is a phenomenon that we don't really understand yet, why this particular, these uh, differential response between the two plants. Yeah, um, Vita Tech and they're also making money selling out of the water. Oh, really? Well, if they if they uh, sell their own version of hexagonal water, then they, they sell hexagonal water it's an apparatus. Oh, an apparatus. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. The 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 earlier studies, which were less scientific, uh, uh, that study. No, that was Vita. That wasn't really a scientific study, but it was a, a farmer that grew, you know, the hemp uh, and got these kind of results. You know, the... Um, no. Okay, good question, but we're uh, in the process of doing that. Uh, we're about to do that with, um, with ironically enough, uh, marijuana, because 
we live in California and a big industry in California and they with these data I can get farmers you know going like oh that's interesting let's go and uh, actually uh, do it ourselves in our farm in our soil uh, and, and see what happens to our plants our marijuana plants so that's ongoing at the moment Um, against uh, titrating up the amounts of minerals that are added to the uh, distilled water to see how much mineral actually you need to put in to see if it's actually mineral being transported in that's actually giving you the response, or is it something specific to the structure of the water itself? Uh, yeah, well, that's uh, uh, a good point. The, que the question was, uh, is it the structuring of the water or is it the minerals? Or is it the, mineral, the water that's structured around the minerals, as I've been proposing all along? Uh, no, so uh, the <clears throat> Vivo water itself is made with a certain uh, concentration and mix of minerals. And uh, that was one of the variables uh, as part of the patent. He did change the mineral concentration around uh, and came up with this optimal ratio and uh, it's proprietary so I can't exactly even show you exactly how much of each mineral is in there but uh, a good control so what you're suggesting is uh, to do a, a study where the control would be the same exact mineral concentration in regular water versus the same minerals in structured water Right. And then increasing uh, minerals uh, in in the ratios that he has, but increase it up to see how much more mineral you need oh. to get the same kind of. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a. If it's actually the minerals getting in or the structure of the water. Well, we haven't done that, uh, but as I said, the amount of minerals was, was determined way back right. 10 years ago when he first got the patent. And it's, uh, yeah, and the, um, it, it, from what I know so far, it sounds like even lower concentrations at, 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 might work better, which is what you're asking. Yeah. Right, water, right, higher, right, higher right. right. Uh, then, uh, yeah. Specific plant propensity to, to go for one right. or another. Well, and the good news is the soil was the same in, bo it, right. in both cases, right. but still, so you know. Trying to <laughs> eliminate that sort of, you know, like, oh, so it's taking, it's just able to transport those minerals that are in better, resulting in the, the greater growth or The structuring, yeah, right? right. So that's what I'm yeah, no, that's a great question, and and needless to say, you know, you do one experiment, and there's ten more you got to do, so it, it never ends. But uh, we, uh, I think, the bottom line is a bit like in the medical field. They 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 used aspirin for years until they really understood the mechanism, how it worked, and the bottom line was everyone could say, well, it works, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and therefore people were using it. So at least I'm presenting the data that we have so far. They say that it works, and obviously we need to do more. But yes, okay, yeah, Phil. The dilution might be might be related to the fact that you sprout. You're going into seeds, and that little root coming out. It might be too much energy in, in, in the in the one to two, twelve hundred. It just might be more. When we did our experiments, we we saw that kind of thing going on. So, so I it might be because you're diluting it, and the and the seed is saying, "Wow, this is much better." Which is the same question? Yeah, what is the optimal concentration of the of the minerals, uh, and that we don't know that uh, uh, yet. So uh, obviously, a lot more research to do. Okay, so now I have one more. We can open it up for questions in a minute. I'm almost finished with the body of this thing here. So then, so then, well, the kind of the question that you just asked is, what, what's the mechanism? How does this happen? Uh, now, what I said so far, I've talked all about the microclusters around the minerals. Okay, that's one possible explanation. But then we have this phenomena of more with less. 
uh, a more stronger biological effect with less of the actives, which is kind of the question you were asking. So uh, the evidence for that going on is based on, well, we already showed you this. That was, that's the uh, uh, microclustering of the minerals getting into the cells. But here's a study that we did uh, with a, a plant extract, a guava extract. Uh, guava contains a chemical called quercetin, which is known to inhibit muscle contraction. And we did this experiment uh, at a university uh, where they set up this uh, standard pharmacological equipment for measuring muscle contraction. So you take a muscle, uh, you put it in a, in a Petri dish, you put electrodes on it, and you measure its ability to contract after you stimulate it with an electrical signal. And it's a standard pharmacological thing. And this is the kind of experiments you get with, with an ordinary extract of guava in distilled water. Uh, you get uh, a, about a 50% uh, inhibition of muscle contraction, uh, which is expected. But then we say, well, okay, well, let's, let, what happens if we take the guava extract and take it up in this uh, microstructured water? What happens? And the answer to that is you have to adjust, in this case, you do have to adjust the concentration so that you get about the same 40% biological effect. So you see the effect. So it's a, that, I, that I just showed you the picture. So, so, but in the case of ordinary extract, you need, uh, so we, oh, we measured the actual concentration of quercetin in the extract. So you need about 600 milligrams per milliliter of quercetin uh, in the extract in order to produce this biological effect. When you take it up in structured water, you only need 0.7 milligrams, uh, which is about a, almost a 9,000-fold difference in the actual amount of quercetin. You need n that much less uh, of, the, of the active ingredient when you take it up in the structured water, which is kind of sort of addressing <laughs> your question. And therefore, that suggests that that uh, the um, uh, that uh, you get uh, if you get a larger, it would either would get a larger biological effect, or you can use less of the nutrient. And of course, in the case of minerals and plant growth, we don't know. This was done with with a mammalian system, so we have to do a similar experiment like you were just proposing. So that is the uh, conclusion from that study, and that's the last scientific study. And just want to say in conclusion, I think I've gotten all these points across, uh, that tap water and most drinking water that's on the market is unstructured, and I would call that dead water. The water in plants and humans, in bio water, if you will, is, is structured. And water around minerals uh, and the size of the structuring allows it to penetrate or not. Uh, and that um, structuring, just the water itself, structured in this way, increases the growth and metabolism of plants. I mean, these are the five take-home messages, which I guess everybody got. And now we can open for questions. Wait. Okay. Oh, we're going to do this properly. Oh, my God. Plenty of time. Uh, so I might have missed this in my post-lunch food coma, but how does the water get structured in an animal? Once it enters the animal, how does it then become structured? Oh, hmm. good question. Yeah, well, I showed you how it happens in nature when it you know, does this, <laughs> flows over the rocks and everything. Um, how does it become? It's it's because of uh, what what uh, I said earlier about this phenomenon called interfacial water. Water at the um, at the edge of a hydrophobic surface becomes structured. Uh, Dr. Pollock calls it easy water, but it's. Um, it's something to do with the interaction of the water with the hydrophobic surface. And I don't think they know much more than that. Nobody really talks about exactly how it happens, but it's a phenomenon in nature 
uh, that occurs, and uh, that means that at least some of the water in the body is structured, because not all of it is in contact with, with, a, with a hydrophobic surface, but that's the phenomena. And therefore, we can conclude that there's a certain amount of the natural water in our body is, uh, is structured. But how it, it have, we don't really know. That's a great question. Stay, stay tuned. Maybe next year. I don't know. Probably Thank not. <laughs> Are you familiar at all with um, ozone unit? Using yeah. an ozone unit to put um, ozone in water? Yes. What's the question? I was wondering what you know about it. Oh, God. That, 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 also, that also structures the water. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think it does. Oh, so that's the question. I don't think that ozonating water structures the water. You can bubble, uh, people are putting ozone in water, people are putting hydrogen gas in water. Uh, uh, in California, we've got a hydrogen water product. Uh, again, nobody spends the money to do the NMR to know whether or not it is structured, so I actually don't know whether it is structured. Did you? What, how come they can be using it in dentist's office and hospitals and blood transfusions oh, and all that kind of stuff? Right. Well, because water, as I said, uh, does uh, 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 hold gas, hydrogen gas, uh, uh, oxygen, CO2, ozone. These are all gases that dissolve in the water. So you're, it's a delivery system for the ozone. It probably has nothing to do with structuring of the water. It's just a delivery system. He's thinking about that. Have you looked at elevated uh, blood pressure? Like no. When you can, and when you can, that intracellular, when you can get to yeah. like 98%, 99 Yeah. Uh, we've seen some elevated blood pressure. Yeah, no, that's an easy thing to measure. Uh, you know, it, uh, uh, I recently just joined forces with Dr. Lorenzen. We have now have our, our own company, uh, separate company. But uh, you know he's been doing this for 20 years, and I summarized the research that he's done mostly, uh, and uh, haven't done that yet. But that's obviously an easy thing to measure, and hypertension is a big big thing, and I'm sure that it would help. Who's got the microphone? Okay. Yeah, let me just ask. Is this on? Yeah. I, it's a question for, I know last year we had a vendor here who had a structured water product. Oh, is this, is this working yeah. better now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, don't mind me. I'm not used to using these mics. <laughs> now, I know last year we definitely had a structured water vendor, and they had a system they were exploring. I think first they would purify the water, then they would structure it. I'm just wondering, I, I suspect, actually probably a lot of us, you'll live in places where there might be some contamination in the water. I was wondering how that works if you use structured water, let's say from a well where maybe there was something in it you, you wouldn't want in there versus just unstructured water. <laughs> okay, so toxins, or well, any molecule in water will be surrounded and, uh, by uh, the hydration shell. And the logic of what I've been saying, uh, I've been talking about you know, minerals, but you would also form a structure around a toxin. And in that sense, the toxins will get into the cell uh, more efficiently. I guess. So that, therefore, the best solution to that problem would be make sure you uh, get rid of the chemical toxins in the water first before you structure it. Um, and there's another point to mention that toxins, because um, I didn't really talk about you know um, cleaning up the water, that's a whole different field, but um, struct, um, toxi toxins when you remove that, I gave this is a lecture I gave a long time at, at another conference in, in Colorado. Uh, that talk, when, you, when you remove the toxins from the water, the energy imprint of the toxins remain behind. And I know Phil's sh shaking his head because he understands that. And that's a concept that it's almost like another whole lecture about the, the energy imprint uh, of, a, of a chemical in the water. Uh, so you've got, you got to remove the chemical, obviously, but then you also have to remove the chemical informational imprint of the toxin in the water. And nobody does that, and that's a big problem. And uh, that may not, talked about homeopathy. That's 
in essence, what homeopathy is. The, the energy of the chemical stays behind and has all kinds of same biological effect uh, as, the, as the parent compound. So that's a great question and important thing to consider. <laughs> Get a, uh, I guess the microphone is making its way around by itself. Okay. What a gentleman. Thank, thanks so much. Um, so, are there, it seems like there's not much studies, like the Lord's water yeah. is structured right. and does some good for a few minutes and then this guy invests a lot of money to prove his stuff stays structured for years. Right. Uh, so how about the um, flow forms or other natural springs? Is healthy structured water out there a lot in nature or in flow forms? Uh, we don't all want to buy patented products from far away all the time. Okay. So yeah, well, so uh, as I said before, that the uh, flow forms uh, probably structure the water, although no one's done the science, uh, but you have to use it right away. But you can if you do this on your farm and, and biodynamic farming, uh, you, I assume that the water is used right away. So, and in Europe, that there, are, there are filters that you can buy that will filter the water and assumedly structure it, but nobody's done the NMR. And then uh, if you use the water right away, so you almost have to put it on the edge of the hose and then, you know, spray it right away, uh, it would also work. Uh, and I mean, ultimately, uh, uh, you can buy the devices that will do that. And whoever showed up last year, it was a device, I assume, they were selling. Uh, uh, and uh, Phil has his own version of a device that structures water, assumedly, because Phil doesn't have enough money to do the NMR. <laughs> but uh, it. Oh, that was Phil. Oh, that was Phil. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and and you see increased yield in your crops with your. The, yeah, right. Our device has quite a bit of energy in it, and, and, and I saw the device that didn't have much energy increase the size and energetics in the plants that we were looking at. We looked at seven different kinds of water, three plants and, and three different sizes of the plants. And, and so we were looking at it, and, and what I really saw a difference in was when I wrote on the side of the water device, <laughs> joy, harmony, balance, and love, that was fabulous. <laughs> it was ridiculous what that happened to the water. And, wow. then, and then the water that, that um, and then the water next to it, on both sides of it, the plants, started to do the same thing that this line did. And the plants that were in the front were doing better than the back, so we moved the whole thing around, and we started coming from the back, and then they caught up. And it was phenomenal to see the plants and the relationship you had when you were doing the structured water and, and, and doing some other things with it. But, but a, a, a structured water device, just vortexing it and then using it right away, that's what we do on our farm. And, and we have a pretty good sized devices and it works great. Yeah, and the, okay, so. Uh, oh, Phil Jones. This is Phil Jones. Phil Jones, Jones Farm. Uh, we're in Chelmsford. Yeah, and so for the record, I just want to add to what Phil just said that uh, the intention of the farmer uh, makes, can make a big difference. Uh, I have done a lot of research on that in terms of mammalian systems uh, and uh, that supports what I said earlier that water is a carrier. It carries nutrients, it carries minerals, and it carries energy. and intention is a kind of energy from the mind, if you will, that can be stored and carried by the water into the plant. And uh, sort of that's another whole lecture uh, in itself. 
uh, but water is a carrier, and uh, we can put all kinds of good things in the water and take out the bad things. <laughs> uh, 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 well, I don't have an. Um, the, the only test for that is the nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. You'd have to send it to a lab and have it done. I don't have one in my lab because it's too expensive. No, I do not have one in my lab. It's too. You have to go to a university, and it'll cost you a lot of money. Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, could be a thousand dollars. I don't. Great results with ozone. Yeah, but that's the ozone. Not, it, 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 the water is a carrier. I believe. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a form of oxygen. Yes, right. And the plants probably have to break it down to oxygen to use it. And I guess they have a way to do that. Uh, yes, uh, you, if you want to buy it and do some experiments, come uh, uh, any farmers here, please come talk to me afterwards. The website was for the number four V I V O. If you want to buy it, buy the concentrate because you can dilute that one to two hundred. You put a little bit in a gallon of water, and then you, you and it lasts for two years. So uh, you know, and if you know, in terms of farming, you know, uh, at some point. We intend to put on the market a uh, using that water as a carrier, and we're not going to obviously use um, uh, uh, guava, uh, but we will put other herbs and, and other energies in the water to even enhance the efficacy beyond just the structuring by itself. Maybe next year we can talk about that. I'm just a new learner at that, so I just want to make sure I wasn't trying to insult or anything. It's just I understand that it, that it's not as objective as I always thought it well, had been. Well, okay, let me let me address that before everyone uh, goes because um, how you design the experiment makes all the difference in the world. And if you design the experiment uh, in a way where you in, want to see an effect like this. Uh, you, you know, if there's an effect, you will see it. But um, I take, for example, the cell phone industry. Okay, a lot of independent scientists have shown that cell phones are harmful to the body. The cell phone industry designs exper does experiments and designs experiments to fail, and hence they end up publishing an article that says, "Oh, cell phones are not harmful." So the average person consumer goes like oh I'm completely confused half of the studies say they're harmful the other half say they're not harmful so yeah I mean science is objective in a sense but it's all a question of how you design the experiment and if you if want to, it to fail you just don't do a long enough treatment time if it takes an hour to see an effect and you do a study and you only expose it for a half an hour you're not going to see an effect it's cheating in a sense, it's not honest, objective science, but it happens a lot, which is your point. These studies were designed and done by an independent lab because uh, we wanted to show an effect, and they were neutral about it, although apparently Vita Technologies may not be so neutral, uh, <laughs> but from what that other lady said. But, uh, you know, this is the first step in, uh, in uh, validating the efficacy of this water for the plant. Uh, agriculture community. Obviously, it works for humans. We've done a lot, of, a lot of studies at different universities. The plant studies need more work, and obviously, we're going to continue to do that. 
and uh, Dan keeps wanting to invite me back every year, so stay tuned, and next year we'll have more, hopefully, more data and another lecture on the topic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat>